حبيب الله رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he wanted humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Rasulullah Habib Allah Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Alhamdulillahi wa kafa wa salamun ala ibadihi alladhin astafa la siyama al-mustafa sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallama tasliman kathira my dear viewers everywhere, welcome to another live edition of our program, Gardens of the Pious. Today's episode is number 535 in the series of Riyadh al-Salihin by Imam Nawawi. May Allah have mercy on him. And uh, we'll continue with the chapter of the obligation of giving thanks, showing gratitude and being grateful to the Almighty Allah for his countless blessings and also for some specific blessings which are being renewed as I'm going to explain shortly inshallah. We tackled a few references in the previous episode which was the first in the chapter and we'll continue with another couple references from the Quran beginning with Surah Al-Isra ayah number 111 and this is a blessing which is an amazing blessing many people only of the human beings who take it for granted the rest of the creation the animals the living and the non-living uh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala acknowledge that they believe so only human beings are in doubt in this respect and few of them who acknowledge this fact which is the greatness of the Almighty Allah and being the only independent and all the creations are his dependent and not having a partner in worship and in the creation not being in need for any assistance or any help and being able to do all things that is the Almighty that people the believers worship so they do not simply worship anything they worship one who is omnipotent, they worship one who is able to do all things ala kulli shay'in qadir. they worship one who is not in need for anyone's help or assistance rather he is a samad all the creatures resort to him for help and he distributes his help non-stop and he is not in need for any assistance he is running the show entirely by himself when you are watching this program right now and you recognize that you're a Muslim and among Muslims you're a person who's following the mainstream of the Ummah yani, Alhamdulillah you believe the same belief of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi and his companions and you avoid the deviant sects and you know that you are of the few of the few of the few of the very minority whom the Almighty Allah chose to put on the straight path to recognize the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the rest وَمَا قَدَرُ اللَّهَ حَقَّ قَدْرِهِ the rest of the human beings they do not really appraise Allah and appreciate Allah as he should be appreciated because they don't know much about him so when you know, when you know that when you say for innocence حَسْبِيَ اللَّهُ وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ what does it mean? and it gives you comfort and a relief when you say حَسْبِيَ Allah, sufficient for me indeed is Allah what does it mean? وَنِعْمَ الْوَكِيلِ and he is the best disposer of all affairs whenever you are having a case brutal treatment from authorities or from gangs or from here and there and you hire a lawyer you have a case when you hire a lawyer who is very clever he charged you arm and leg he is very expensive and he is well known of winning the cases you feel comfy you trust the lawyer so much you say I'm not worried the least I know he, he's gonna take me out of it 
okay why because you have a very strong law firm taking care of your case whenever you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your representative whenever you have Allah the Almighty on your side if Allah is your assistant then who can dare to oppose you when Allah the Almighty says man ada li waliyan adhantuhu bil harb let it be an individual or a group of people or a gang or a military or a nation or the whole world Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to teach those beautiful meanings as essential tethers of our belief even to the youngsters so Abdullah ibn Abbas is about 12 13 years old he is traveling with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa they are both riding on the same mount and he says ya ulam oh young boy let me teach you a few words it's a long hadith among the teachings that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam inspired this young man Abdullah ibn Abbas he is a teenager back then he said I'lam. you have to be fully certain of the following fact you have to acknowledge the following fact you have to believe in it and you have to have it deep settled in your heart لو أن الأمة اجتمعت على أن يضروك بشيء فلن يضروك إلا بشيء قد كتبه الله عليك ولو اجتمعوا على أن ينفعوك بشيء فلن ينفعوك إلا بشيء قد كتبه الله لك رفعت الأقلام وجفت الصحف We all need to understand this statement Then the next step after we comprehend it we truly believe in it so that we live with comfort we stop suffering of anxiety, fear, depression, worrying. He says, young man, you got to understand that and you got to believe that if the whole world, if all people, the human beings, the jinn, the kings, the rulers, the governments, uh, the armies, the individuals, every person, if they all got together, they put their efforts together with their intelligences and with their in order to harm me with anything they will never be able to harm you with anything which was not preordained for you so whatever happens to you was already preordained for you but if all those people keep planning or plotting and Allah doesn't want this thing to happen to you khalas, don't worry about it likewise if they all gather to benefit you with anything a typical example what we're living in right now the infectious disease, the COVID-19, this pandemic disease, and how it is more democratic in any democratic nation or government on earth. For real, it doesn't distinguish between rich and poor. It doesn't distinguish between men and women or uh, the capacity. What is your capacity in the community? So we have seen prime ministers, presidents, got infected and they have to isolate themselves for a couple of weeks and we have we have seen some ministers who died army generals army generals they have special forces they have uh, maximum security to protect them they are literally untouchable but with the least of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which is an unseen even with the regular microscope creature virus it is threatening the safety and the security of the entire existence subhanallah so if the whole nation and if the whole world got together to offer you any benefit to spare your life for instance to save your life to make you live any longer if that was not ordained for you by Allah it would never happen the case is closed الأقلام, the pens which records the actions and the destination have been lifted so it doesn't write anymore and the record is closed وَجَفَّتُ الصُّحُفُ and uh, it's folded that nothing gonna be changed in it whenever you are a believer and you believe literally in everything of what was mentioned earlier so when you say حسبي الله ونعم الوكيل this is a kind of dhikr okay it gives you the same comfort and assurance that was given to Ibrahim when all the givings 
were confirming that this man is going to be dead in a matter of a couple minutes. He was falling in the midst of fire that the people couldn't come close because of the blaze. In a few minutes, he will turn into ash. But when he said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil, out of belief and certainty, he was untouched. Now Ibrahim was the real untouchable. The real untouchable. We, we, we hear about the president of whatever country because of some demonstrations. They rush him into the bunker under the ground. You cannot hide from the virus though. A bunker, space shuttle, you know, it chases you. Why? Because this is the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is one of the hosts of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is giving us messages, which is, I'm going to be with him so that I shouldn't be afraid of anything else. Because if Allah is with me, when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says to Abi Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu in the cave, ما ظنك بسنين الله ثالثهما يا أبا بكر how could you fear how could you worry the least we're not alone what do you think of two whom they're not alone God is with them is with them physically stuck in this little cave doesn't make any sense he's with them with his help with his support with his protection with distraction, distracting the attention of the enemies. So Abu Bakr says to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa look, we, we see their feet. And if any of them happen to look down, they will see us. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa have achieved this level of certainty. Because he said, Hasbi Allah wa ni'mal wakil. Not only by the tongue, but before the tongue, he said it by the heart. فأنزل الله سكينته عليه. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent his tranquility upon him. As a result of this firm belief that Allah is able to do all things, and I put my trust in him, and he is indeed the best disposer of all affairs, it gives me the comfort. And I'm not worried the least. It gives me the assurance. So, I'm recovered. I don't have any anxiety anymore. I never get depressed. I know everything is running by him. Having all these givings in mind and believing that the one whom I worship is not some sort of God whenever the temple catches fire, God is burned because he is, uh, for some people, a statue or wood or a building or any of the living creatures has a lifespan beginning and end. No, he is none of that. He is, as he said in Surah Al-Shura in Ayah number 11, لَيْسَ كَمِثْلِهِ شَيْءٌ there is nothing like him because above all of that we're all creatures and he's a creator so when you deal with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you shouldn't assume that you're dealing with an honorable man or a boss or the president sometimes when I listen to the rulers of some countries the way they talk the amount of arrogance the amount of ego I swear, I think that those people at one point, they think that they are God on earth. Even though in the same palace or in the same office that they are in, they're walking around with their personal doctor, their physician, why in case that he gets sick. So you know that he gets sick. You know that he can eat something bad, he can suffer diarrhea or constipation, stomachic, he can get a heart attack. All of that is expected and that's why we have vice and the beauty. So why do you think you're yourself untouchable? Why do you think yourself above all? Al-Mu'min who believes in all the previous facts, so he says by his heart, before he utters it, by his tongue, Hasbi Allah wa ni'm al-wakil, sufficient for me indeed is Allah and he is the best disposer of all affairs. He truly believes that he is untouchable as long as Allah is with him. I believe in the one who is the omnipotence, who is al-samad, al-lam yalid, wa-lam yunad, wa-lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad, laysa ka mithlihi shay'un huwa al-sami'u al-basir. So I'm different. I'm definitely different. I'm unique. People fight and kill each other because, oh, you hurt my God. Aren't you ashamed to say you hurt my God? 
What do you mean you hurt your God? You killed my God. Or you burned my God. Or you destroyed my God. What happened to your intellect? What happened to your common sense? But in the case of those who are monotheistic, and they believe that God is the creator, and he was never created, and he doesn't have any being other than being the divine being, and the only creator, they say what? They are commanded in Surah Al-Isra in ayah number 11 to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we will learn why. But let's listen to the ayah. Check out the ayah. وَقُلِ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي لَمْ يَتَّخِذْ وَلَدًا وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ شَرِيكٌ فِي الْمُلْكِ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ وَلِيٌّ مِّنَ الذُّلِّ وَكَبِّرُهُ تَكْبِيرًا Say Alhamdulillah, that's a command verb. So say it, everybody, wherever you may be at right now, say Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah, what does it mean? Coming along after we learn the meaning of ayah. Say Alhamdulillah, all praises and thanks, all gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For what? For not taking a son nor a partner in the creation, in his dominion. And he has no need of a protector or of weakness. And glorify him with great glorification. Why do kings... Why do army generals come and walk alone? They are being threatened. There is a danger. So there is a secret service. There is a SWAT team. There is the Marines, special forces, the intelligence, and then the frontliners, the cops. Many, many, many people to protect one person. We think that you are the greatest person, but I am vulnerable still. Because I'm a human being, I'm a creation, one of the creation, right? But when you're worshiping the creator, who's above all of that, who doesn't need any assistance, doesn't need any protection out of weakness because he is the all-powerful, the most strong, the one who provides security and protection, then alhamdulillah, shukla, you are on the right track. So out of all those people, out of all those seven point six billion human uh, beings living on earth now you're one of the very few whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said very few of my servants who are grateful they are grateful because they recognize the truth they recognize the ni'mah and it leads them to the mun'am they recognize the blessing and the blessings and the countless blessings and favors and that leads them to recognize the bestower of the blessings or the favors. Alhamdulillah. So when you say Alhamdulillah, you say it while you really mean it. It is the outcome of a firm belief. And that gives you that assurance. And that gives you the yaqeen. And the yaqeen leads you to the true tawakkul or putting your trust truly in Allah as it should be. The very first word in the Quran Surah Al-Fatiha is Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Why? And if you remember, in the previous episode I said, inshallah, this episode we will tackle uh, the question of what is the difference between Alhamd and Al-Shukr and if there is any difference between them. Some people, I want to say some people, I don't mean people who are sitting on the coffee shop or laymen. Uh, I mean the ulama, the true scholars of the deen and the sharia, the tafsir and the fiqh and the hadith, assumed that alhamd and al-shukr are synonymous and there is no difference between uh, both of them. But this is a single view. In other views, of course, there is a difference and that makes sense uh, from even an educational and a tafsir point of view for the following reason. When you say Alhamdulillah wa shukrullah, if a shukr is similar to Alhamd, then what is the point of repeating the same word over? And when you add the letter wow, in Arabic means atifa and. So they are different, maybe similar in certain things, but they are not identical. So what did you eat for lunch today? I ate bread and what else? And I ate bread. Bread and bread and bread. 
if you say that, do you think people would, uh, would accept it from you and say this, this man is a normal human being? Of course not. You know, uh, maybe the bread is made of different flour, of wheat, of maize, of rice, whatever. But you have to be specific. So I tend to accept the view that alhamd and ashukr are not identical. Alhamd has a meaning and ashukr has a meaning. And they started explaining many differences. I don't want to take the entire time discussing this matter, but among the very well received and accepted views that Alhamd is what you say by the tongue. When you praise somebody, you say, Alhamdulillah. When you say, thank you. While Ashok is much more specific because it requires the involvement of the heart by acknowledging that uh, this one has bestowed a favor upon you or this favor has been bestowed upon you by this one so I need to thank him say alhamdulillah shukran thank you so that's shukr that's more specific than ham secondly when somebody does you a favor and say thank you so much you're expected not to I know that person not to hurt his feeling and not to harm him furthermore correct in the case of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bestowing a ni'mah upon you, a shukr entails when you recognize it and when you thank him by the tongue and when you recognize that by the heart, then you shouldn't do anything that displeases him. Especially through misusing or misutilizing the gift which he bestowed upon you. Alhamdulillah, Allah gave me a beautiful house and a nice car. To do what with it? You know, I throw parties every other day, bring girls, and we drink with the ni'mah which he bestowed upon you, with the car which he gave it to you as a gift. You know, how many people around you cannot afford a wheel of this vehicle that you're driving? He gave it to you to do what? You can pick up girls and have dates and uh, drink in the car or smoke weed and so on. I, I feel shy. I feel embarrassed to do that. Disobey him and upset him. Disobey his command through the ni'mah which he bestowed upon me and the gift which he gifted me with. So that is a shukr. They also say alhamd is general. Like you say all the time, alhamdulillah, 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 ala kulli hal. Praise be to Allah for everything. What we're certain of that it is good and what we may seem to us as maybe it's a test. Okay? While a shukr is for a ni'mul mutajaddida in case that, uh, yani, mashallah, your son got married, it's a blessing. He needs to give shukr and you need to give shukr because of a specific ni'mah, a specific blessing that the Almighty Allah bestowed upon you. So it requires a specific way of giving thanks and praises. So a shukr is more specific than alhamd. And there's a long list of differences. But that's why we say alhamdulillah, then we say ashukru lillah as well. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most merciful, the one who is fully aware of everything, ahata bi kulli shay'in ilman, wa la yuhiituna bi shay'in min ilmihi illa bi ma sha'a. The very dhikr which he did not leave for his servants to assume a way to thank him through is giving praises and thanks, shukr and alhamd. So he inspired us with a simple way. Whether you are a professor of linguistics in Harvard, in Al-Azhar University, in Umm Al-Qura, if you are the most sophisticated person, the most eloquent person, or you are a janitor, or a person who is in a middle school or fourth grader, everyone, everyone is inspired to give thanks simply by a simple phrase, which is Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. That's it, that's it. You don't have to be very complicated. So whenever you're blessed, you say Alhamdulillah. And whenever you remember that you're safe, you're sound, and you've been protected from uh, what others have been afflicted with, they say Alhamdulillah. Whenever you sit by yourself and you remember that his blessings are beyond count, you say, Alhamdulillah. And for being aware of the fact that his blessings are beyond count and I'm enjoying them and I'm living in them around the clock 24-7,
So I say Alhamdulillah between you and I that's another blessing. Why? Because a lot of people around you they take it for granted and they think they did it all. They did work hard and that's why they made the company and they made the earning and they made the investment and they have this bank account. They do not give the credit to the ar to the provider, the quwwat al mateen It's because of their geniusness. This is what they think. Okay? So very few, Allah said it. Allah said it in the Quran. Very few of his servants who are grateful, who recognize that this is from him and thank you so much. And they know how to thank him. So for being of the few, that's another blessing. Oh, so you say for it what? You say Alhamdulillah. So you say Alhamdulillah in the first place because you recognize the blessing or the blessings. Then you say Alhamdulillah for being reminded, for being inspired, for being made to recognize who is Al-Munim, who is the bestower of the blessings, and for saying it, for giving thanks. Alhamdulillah. So it's another Alhamdulillah. And uh, again, I just recognize that I didn't say Alhamdulillah because I recognized it on my own, but he has guided me. So Alhamdulillah for Alhamdulillah for Alhamdulillah infinitely, without limit, without borders. Alhamdulillah, عدد ما خلق ملء السماوات والأرض وملء ما بينهما وملء ما شئت من شيء بعد as we say upon rising up for more kuwa. We'll continue with this inshallah after a short break. Please stay tuned. Our brothers and sisters around the world, what a good news and glad tidings coming to you right at where you are. Explaining the 18th chapter of Quran from the beginning to the end, where Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala codified the life of human being. By the permission of Allah, we've elucidated the meaning of this chapter for each and every human being to benefit. And by the permission of Allah, this will be aired only on Huda TV, Nectarus of the Cave, i.e. the nectar of the chapter, the secret of the chapter, the blessings, the lessons that Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala left for human being to benefit. The chapter had exposed everything to us and we have it under the theme, the Nectarus of the Cave. Remain blessed in waiting for it and stay tuned. Wassalamu alaikum khitaman wakti. Shots from Mecca al mukarrama The Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as an orphan. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his family. The first revelation of Iqra. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the year of the elephant. These and more bi ta'ala we will discuss in our program entitled Snapshots of Mecca al mukarrama Today we want to talk about the ways, the actual practical ways to achieve happiness. So that way we can attain that success in this dunya and in the next uh, as, as men in particular, we are financially responsible for our families and also we will be asked about our money mm. in the hadith it mentions, where it came from and what we spent it on. Mm. But the major sins that needs tawbah, that needs 
uh, you know, real repentance, real serious repentance. I want to focus the majority of this uh, episode on the major signs as they are uh, mainly more important and of course they, you know, we can relate to them uh, and hopefully increase us in Iman which will in turn make us uh, successful Muslims inshallah. So. The fact that Allah is telling us about Jannah and Jahannam, we should take heed mm. so that we can wake up. The fact that Allah is telling us about the Day of Judgment, what will happen uh, is because when we experience it, we can't deny it. The Prophet says, each and every one of us is a shepherd and each shepherd is responsible for his flock. There's nothing more beautiful, more pleasing, more pleasure inducing to a parent than to see their children being obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As parents, we are responsible for our children. We're responsible to upbring them to be righteous practicing Muslims. We're responsible to make them positive elements of our community. There's nothing more beautiful than for a parent to see their sons and their daughters being obedient to Allah and following in the footsteps of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu With every great amana comes great responsibility. In order to know how to do this, in order to gain knowledge of how to be successful in aligning our upbringing to the Quran and the Sunnah, Join us on this episode, on these segments of Life's Adornments. Myself, Yusuf Kroma, and Sheikh Asim Lukman Al Hakim, we will take you on a journey, on a lesson filled enlightenment where we will discuss these crucial matters. We look forward to having you. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers beginning with the record are 002 then 0238551. Alternatively, a record 002 then 0100546 The WhatsApp numbers are record 001 and the air code 001-361-489-1503. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Imran from the UK. Assalamu alaikum, akhi. Uh, wa alaikum assalam, Sheikh. Welcome to uh, the program. I have a question to ask. Jazakallah. Uh, uh, it's really nice uh, to, first time ever I have um, joined this uh, studio in, in a call, so alhamdulillah. Um, Sheikh, I have a question to ask you. Uh, I've been having, uh, recently I got closer to my deen. I've been learning more about my deen, alhamdulillah. But, um, <clears throat> you know, we have this, yeah, so we have, we have the four imams in terms of uh, different madhabs. So if my family members are following the type of madhab, but, you know, I, f I felt interested in uh, learning uh, other madhabs. Uh, would that be, I mean, if my pa I got your question. Hello? Uh, yeah, I got your question, uh, Imran, from the UK. Uh, in brief, brothers and sisters, again, uh, that the different schools of thoughts of fiqh and legislations are not different religions, nor different sects and groups. Rather, they hold different views in the matters of fiqh, in the fiqh issue. So you say, well, you know, Hanifa, at one point, believe that you are not permitted to wipe over the socks, okay? But later on, he agreed with his students, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad and Zufar, and towards the end of his life, he changed his view. The vast majority of the scholars, yes, you may wipe over your socks for a day and night, in a state of uh, 
for the period of a day and night instead of taking off your socks, whether fabric socks or leather socks. So there is a difference of opinion. Moving the finger in the prayer, do you move it up and down, right and left, or you keep it fixed, pointing towards the qibla? Differences. You raise uh, your hands with the takbir, or you don't. But besides the khilaf in the masail, which we call it furu'a, the branches of fiqh, not in the concept of belief, not in the articles of faith, alhamdulillah, they're all among the a'imma and the scholars of Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah. It is unfortunately the culture which imposes its own cultural traditions on the madhab and then they make it seem as if this is our religion. Yes, I have heard that. Alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me and I travel the world and I have seen communities which are pure Shafi'is in Sri Lanka in Malaysia, Indonesia, in Singapore, and I have seen some communities which are pure Hanafi, yani they follow the Islam, but they believe in the Masail of the Fiqh according to Imam Abu Hanifa. Uh, whether to pay zakah on the jewelry of a woman or not, difference of opinion, and so on. So if you decide for layman, you follow your local Imam. You're following Taqi Uthmani in Islamabad. So he says, uh, or in Karachi, he says, this is the fatwa. You act upon it, alhamdulillah, you're cool. Now, mashallah, you studied for a year and two, you enrolled in a school and you studied fiqh, and now you have an access to study different madhahib, different schools of fiqh, and you're very determined to follow the most authentic of every madhahib. That is the most upright situation, but it is for educated people in fiqh or the deen. The layman, it would be sufficient to ask your local sheikh whether he's Hanafi or Shafi'i or Maliki. Sometimes you travel abroad, like those who are living in, in Europe, those who are living in the States. Set aside the madhahib and the cultural practices. The imam should be very comprehensive and he's educated. He graduated from a prestigious school of fiqh and he knows the ahkam. So he chooses for the community and for the ummah the most authentic in the light of his education. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Fawzia from the UK. Sister Fawzia, welcome to the program. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back. Go ahead. Uh, okay, Brother Salah, I have two questions today. So my first question is about Epicaf, that uh, this Ramadan, before this Ramadan, I planned to do Epicaf, and I thought I'm going to do all 10 days, um, I'm going to sit in Epicaf. So I I don't fully plan taking time off from work and everything. So I had an intention. So when the time came nearby, obviously due to COVID-19, the mosques were closed. So I just thought in my head, which I shouldn't have, thought that Atkaf can be done at home if Juma can be prayed at home. So on the 21st um, after Maghrib, I thought I will do Atkaf. And I don't know, somehow it came in my mind that uh, I should call mosque to know. So then when I called mosque, but I started my Atkaf, like just maybe half an hour, 20 minutes. And then uh, I called mosque. They told me that there is no etikaf at home this year because it can be only done in the mosque, as it says in Quran. So then I didn't do it. So I wanted to know, does it become compulsory for me to do in next year? Um, if it does, if it doesn't, then that's fine. But if it does, I want to know that uh, in case uh, I, I get married in future. But in, sorry? I'm just listening. Okay, so in case I get married next year, what if my husband doesn't allow me to do this nafli ibadah? It becomes compulsory. So do continue this. And the second question is about the eyebrows. That uh, I know the threading eyebrows is haram, but what if we can use just like black pencil to make them to beautify ourselves, like with makeups? Would it be thin as well? So if you just let me know these two things, please. Okay. Guide your questions, Sister Fawziya from the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Asya from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome back, Sister Asya. Uh, 
مبارک لارد شد مبارک you have a new baby mashallah uh, i missed that long program on ebay because i was busy making shirkurma biryani and got so much tired i could not see that program of all the few coming uh, you know and sister asia is not fair that you tell us now you're making biryani and uh, we cannot get some <laughs> and um, what about I the sweet with the silver and gold do you guys still make the sweet with the silver uh, sheets yes. and, and gold yeah yeah, yeah but, but here we don't get in Saudi Arabia. In, in, in India, they get. Yeah, Saudis are know, poor. You then. guys are very rich. You, <laughs> you work with gold and silver. <laughs> I don't know. That, somebody asked me this question, and they, they request me to ask. I said, I will ask after Ramzan. Sheikh is, Sheik is very busy. No, you please ask. I need, I need. And then I said, I see Sheikh will give, inshallah, reply. I will convey the message to you. Okay. Then she said, okay, fine. So, inshallah, I'm waiting for that reply also. And then uh, by, by, I, by, uh, we want to see your kids, Sheikh. Mashallah. Inshallah. <laughs> uh, inshallah. <laughs> yeah, we want to see your kids, inshallah. Hmm. And uh, the thing, uh, mashallah, very nice explanation of Alhamdulillah and Shukr. And really, uh, we need this uh, because we cannot make out the difference between Alhamdulillah and shukr and people sometimes we suppose we uh, now we are we know we are fine we say they ask us how are you so we say be fine uh, just we are about to say alhamdulillah they say why you're not saying alhamdulillah why you are saying just fine i mean people say like this also uh, there are so many jazakallah uh, khair if you open it more inshallah we we'll learn it more inshallah jazakallah khair thank you sister asya may allah bless you and your family Sister Fawzia from the UK um, had a couple of questions concerning Atikaf. Uh, first of all, Atikaf for men or women alike, it should be done only in the masjid. And this is what Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah. He said, وَلَا تُبَاشِرُوهُنَّ وَأَنْتُمْ عَاكِفُونَ فِي الْمَسَاجِدِ It is true that according to Imam Abu Hanifa, women uh, may do i'tikaf at home because the Prophet ﷺ said that their prayer at home is superior reward to praying in the masjid. But we have many eyewitnesses that Hafsa and Aisha and Musalama and Zainab and the sister who called yesterday the hadith in, in Bab al Hayd in the book of Bukhari, uh, it was Zainab bin Tajahsh. So the wives of the Prophet or some of whom did observe i'tikaf during his life with him in the masjid. And it was in Ramadan, and sometimes after Ramadan, and then they did i'tikaf after his departure as well, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So i'tikaf, sister Fawziya, is in the masjid. And i'tikaf is recommended. It's sunnah, it's not obligatory. Any act of worship which is not obligatory can only be obligatory whenever you obligate it on yourself by making what is known as nazr. So when you say, Lillahi alayya, if I live the next year, I must do i'tikaf in the masjid. If you say i'tikaf, then in any masjid, it will do it. If you specify, it will be 10 days, and in this particular masjid, then the niyyah must be fulfilled according to your intention. In that particular masjid, certain uh, number of days or certain time as you vowed. So without making a vow, you say, inshallah, next Ramadan I'm making i'tikaf. I wasn't able to do i'tikaf because of the closure of the masajid. Alhamdulillah, you've got a full reward, mashallah, even though you're sitting at home and you didn't do i'tikaf. But there is no i'tikaf at home. Likewise, for every act of worship, it would be only if it is ma uh, recommended. It cannot be made mandatory unless if you vow it. So if you did not make a vow, don't worry about it. Uh, like in the eyebrows in Islam is forbidden for men and women, but bleaching some of the eyebrows is permissible. Assalamu alaikum. Ahmed from Gambia. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalamu alaikum. Welcome to the program, Akhi Ahmed. Naam, what do you have in mind? Hello? I hear you. Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, Sheikh. No. Um, I'm, I want to. I'm asking a question. If like, um, when we are praying at Tajweed in Ramadan. No. 
Yeah, um, we holding the uh, opening the Quran. We reading um through the uh, the Quran. Maybe. Wa alaikum salam, Chef. How are you, sir? Yeah, I got your question. It is permissible, Ahmed, to hold the Quran in the non-obligatory prayer in the nafila, in tahajjud, in sunnah, night prayer, in tarawih. It's permissible to read from an open mushaf or Quran, or even from uh, your phone if you have a soft copy of the Quran. Last ayah before we uh, end up. Uh, because this ayah brings a lot of joy and delight to my heart and I just simply wanted to share with you. And we're not done with the hamd yet. We'll continue saying alhamdulillah until we get there. Get where? In Surah Yunus in ayah number 10 Allah the Almighty says دعواهم فيها سبحانك اللهم وتحيتهم فيها سلام وآخر دعواهم أن الحمد لله رب العالمين دعواهم في هذا word دعواهم consists of دعوة which is دعاء invocation or call هم the pronoun their call their invocation in الجنة فيها يعني in paradise will be saying سبحانك اللهم exalted be you, O oh Allah, exalted are you, O oh Allah. Well, Subhanak Allahumma, when we come to a tasbih, we will, inshallah, explain in detail the meaning of Subhanak Allahumma and tasbih. But the rough meaning is, glory be to you, exalted are you, O oh Allah. Okay? وَتَحِيَّتُهُمْ فِيهَا salam, And the greeting, they will be greeting each other, Ahlul Jannah the dwellers of paradise and the angels will be greeting them saying assalamu alaikum peace be with you tahiyyatuhum fiha salam and that will be the reply it is the greeting of ahlul jannah wa akhir da'wahum an alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin and the last of their dua will be to say alhamdulillah thanks and praises be to allah Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of everything that exists, all the worlds, the known and the unknown to us. Tayyip, what does it mean? It also means, brothers and sisters, Ahlul Jannah, insha'Allah, once they set their foot in Al Jannah. And we know also in the Surah, Allah said, Lahum ma yasha'una fiha wa mazid, anything that they desire. In Al Jannah, they will get it and they will get even bonus, extra. We have more for them, which is seen Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The interesting part is when somebody desires to eat a particular food, I know you guys would still desire to eat biryani in Jannah. Will, will there be any biryani in Jannah? Yes, but not cooked by us. Okay, anything you desire. So you don't say, oh Allah, I would like to eat biryani. What is the menu? I would like to eat this or drink this or to do that. No, you wouldn't have to say it. Rather, they would say, Subhanakallahumma, exalted are you, oh Allah, glory be to you, oh Allah. But I didn't say anything. I mean, I did not specify, I like to eat this, I like to drink that. And the table will be spread with thousands of dishes to fulfill your dream and more. So the call, if they need anything, anything, they wouldn't have to ask for it. They will just say, Subhanakallahumma. And then the angels passing among them, fulfilling their wishes and serving them, say, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, Sister Asi, Assalamu alaikum, Fawziya, Assalamu alaikum, all the believers in Al Jannah. That is the greeting. And that's why, you know. We do not exchange it for good morning or good evening or how are you or good afternoon. It's okay to say all of that. But among the Muslims and the believers, Afshu salama baynakum. It is the greeting of Ahlul Jannah. So assalamu alaikum. Then they ate, they drank, they finished, they enjoyed whatever they desired. So they thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fil akhir. By the end, the last of their call. So in the beginning they said, I want this. They said, Subhanakallahumma. Their wishes are being fulfilled and done. They ate and drank. They say, Alhamdulillah. Akhiru da'wahum to say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. Very fascinating way to praise Allah. To say, 
الحمد لله رب العالمين في الأولى والأخيرة Brothers and sisters to be continued إن شاء الله next time until then السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته One and only glory to him. He born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise, worshiping cows, fire, and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price. So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise. Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price Rasulullah